The following message by Jonathan Griffiths is made available by Encounter the Truth. For more information, visit us online at EncounterTheTruth.org. Friends, do please take a seat. Let me add my welcome here to the Met. It's great to be together, and we're so glad that each and every one of you has been able to join us. Welcome to you who are here in the sanctuary, and welcome as well to those who are in the chapel. We conclude our series this morning in stewardship from Luke's gospel by looking at Luke chapter 19, and I'd invite you to take up a Bible and turn with me there, if you would, to Luke chapter 19, page 878, if you're using a church Bible, and I'm going to read for us from verse 11 down to verse 27, Luke 19 and verse 11. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable, because he was near to Jerusalem, and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then to return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten ten minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities." And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, and you are to be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit, and you reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, and at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. As we come to the Word of God, let's come before our Father in prayer that He might help us understand His Word and take it to heart. Let's pray together. God, our Father, we know that we have nowhere else to go, for You alone have the words of eternal life. And so, coming to You and turning to Your Word, we pray that in your kindness you would show us Christ through the preaching of your word, and we pray that you would be kind enough to us to reveal your glory, that we might delight in our Savior and be conformed into his image from degree to degree in increasing measure. And we pray that this would be to his glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, one thing we need to learn how to do well in the Christian life is to wait, to wait well, to maximize the time we spend waiting. I wonder if you are good at waiting. I've spent a bit of time in airports in recent weeks and months, more time than I'd like to spend, actually. But the departure lounge, as you will know, can be a bit of a wearying place. There's something uniquely challenging about waiting in that context, especially if there's a delay, which there is so often. You know the feeling, you know, you, you, you rush to the airport to board your flight, you've timed it perfectly, which I love to do, you know, just enough time to get through security, to walk straight to your gate, for boarding, and you do it, and you're feeling very, very pleased with yourself. You haven't wasted any time. You just walk right there. And then comes the dreaded announcement while you're standing at the gate. There is a mechanical problem on this plane, just a small one. 
uh, there is a, a delay on the inbound flight. Get comfortable. It could be a long wait. How are we going to use that time? Maximize that time. Redeem that time. You know, do we uh, download mindless games for the phone? Do we stream a TV series? Do we uh, buy a magazine at the gift shop? Do we get out the laptop and do some work? Do we strike up a conversation with waiting passengers? Or do we just sit and stare at the information board? What do we do with that time? How do we use it well? As Christian people, we are living in a prolonged state of waiting, aren't we? We are waiting and waiting for our Savior to return, for our Lord to arrive. And the wait, it has been quite a long one. Now, Jesus knew that this would be an issue for us and a challenge for us, and he took pains to prepare us for the wait and to teach us how to wait well. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus is just arriving at the city of Jerusalem. He's just coming. He's just about to enter it as our passage concludes. This, we know, will be the end of his earthly ministry and indeed his earthly pilgrimage. He is on his way to the cross where he will suffer and die. He will soon leave his disciples. But, you know, their understanding of all this, it's limited. It's, it's patchy at this point in time. Many of them believed that as their Messiah, Jesus was going to, you know, march into Jerusalem, defeat the Romans, restore the glory of Israel, and bring in the full experience of the kingdom of God. They didn't yet understand that this Messiah, the true Messiah, was not in the first instance a political or a military figure. His deliverance would come not through a glorious military conquest at the head of a great army, but rather through a scandalous execution upon a cross of shame and of suffering. And knowing this expectation that the kingdom of God would be seen in some tangible way within days or within hours, Jesus now sets out in our passage to reset expectations and to prepare his disciples for the very long wait ahead. Yes, he would return in glory. Yes, there would be a day of visible and tangible victory, but there will be a long time of waiting before all that. Notice how Jesus introduces our parable, verse 11. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God would appear immediately. The parable Jesus now tells is given, is calculated, is designed to address this issue of misplaced expectations for the timing of the appearing of his kingdom. It is designed to help them wait and to wait well. The story is that of a, a nobleman who went away to a far country in order that he might be given a kingdom and returned to claim that kingdom. He goes away to see the ruler with authority to hand that kingdom to him, and once he has received that from the ruler in the faraway land, he will return then as king. Now, this is actually a familiar idea in the Roman world. Rulers like Herod the Great and Herod Antipas, they, they had to go to Rome in order to be crowned, and then they had to return to their territory to rule. The, the idea might sound a little bit odd to you and to me, but to Jesus' hearers, this was actually a familiar concept. And, of course, the parallels with Jesus himself here in the story are pretty obvious right from the start. Jesus is shown to be the rightful king in the very next section of Luke's gospel when he enters in Jerusalem. He is going to die and rise and then ascend to the Father's side, and the Father will grant to him the kingdom, and he will return to earth to claim his own. The fact that this nobleman represents Jesus, the coming king, that much is clear enough to all of us, I think. So, okay, what does the nobleman of this parable do? Well, we see it there. He calls together these ten servants, gives them a, a portion of his wealth, ten minas between them, one mina each. Each mina is worth about a hundred days' wages. And he tells them, look, engage in business until I return. Put this money to work. Do something productive with it while I am away. 
That's both trusting of him and it is strategic of him. He gives his servants some opportunities, you know, to, to stretch their wings, to take on some responsibility, but he wants to see activity. He wants to see progress. He wants to see a return on his investment. But while he is gone, a number of things happen which might surprise us a little bit as readers. Some citizens, emboldened by his absence, express their hatred of him. Within his household, some of his servants, they get to work industriously. That's what's going on within the household. They invest his funds. Other servants within the household more or less sit on their hands and do nothing. And so when the nobleman returns, now having received the kingdom as his own, having been emboldened and empowered by his enthronement, there comes a time of reckoning. There are consequences both for the rebellious and the inactive, and there is reward for the industrious and the productive. Now, the story is here to teach us and prepare us for the time of waiting that comes between Jesus' ascension to the Father and his return to claim the kingdom. The time of waiting has lasted already 2,000 years or so, and today, you and I, we, we continue to wait. What do we need to know and understand about this time of waiting? And what are the implications for us who believe? Well, here in the passage, Jesus sets before us the profile of three different types of people. Three types of people who represent the three different ways of waiting. And here they are. There is the waiting marked by industry. There is the waiting marked by inactivity, and there is the waiting marked by insurrection. All three ways of waiting are possible. All three ways of waiting can actually be seen in the world today. And Jesus wants to show us by the end where each of them will lead to at the time of his return. First then, there is the waiting marked by industry. That is, by faithful and fruitful activity, by wise investment, by impressive return. I read recently in the press, and I don't know if you noticed this as well, that a professor at a medical school in New York has made a massive donation to the school, $1 billion, the largest of its kind ever, I gather, a donation that will allow all 1,000 medical students at that school to pay no fees at all going forward permanently. It will be a tuition-free school from now on. The professor's husband had been a canny investor on Wall Street, and he left this vast fortune uh, to the care of his wife, and the investments enabled her to do this profound good for her institution, to make this immense contribution. I, I think it's a delightful story, actually, and we, you know, we got to take our hats off to this lady and to her late husband for what's been done. Well, here our attention is drawn to a very successful investor, but one in a very different place, in a very different age. The nobleman, as we've seen, he knows he's going to be away for an extended period of time. But he doesn't want to waste that time on his estate. He wants his assets to be put to productive use. He wants the work to go forward. So he gets these servants together. He gives them their mina each. It's not a, a vast sum. No, it's, it's 100 days' wages, but that's real money. It's enough to do something with. And here are his instructions, verse 13, engage in business until I come. Now, again, I think that's a delightful approach to management and to delegation and to trust. Here's some of my money. You know, I'm leaving it with you. You go out and do something entrepreneurial and productive with these resources. You know, use your initiative, spread your wings a little bit, dream a dream, get to work, make something happen. So it's a bold move. It's trusting. It involves a degree of risk. And the nobleman, the key thing here to see is he really does want to see results. You know, it's a, it's a big trip that he's going on. It's significant personally for him. He's gone, you know, to have his kingdom conferred upon him by this ruler in the faraway land. Big deal for him personally. But his first thought when he returns to base is to see how has my project gone? How have my investments performed? Verse 15. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. He wants to know, and he wants to see, 
And remember, he's now not only a nobleman, but a king, and he has all authority to call these servants to account. And, you know, the initial interviews, the initial reports, they go very, very well. Verse 16, the first came before him saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. Now, that's a fantastic return. Uh, you know, I'm no mathematician, and you can correct me if I'm wrong at the end, but I think uh, one mina turned to ten minas is a 1,000% return. Isn't that right? Not too shabby. You know, that is the stuff of hedge fund dreams. Fantastic. And, you know, the nobleman, he's, he's, he's duly impressed. He's pleased. He's even delighted. Verse 17, and he said to him, well done, good servant. Because you've been faithful in a very little you shall have authority over ten cities. The servant, he's done, he's done well. Yeah, he's proved his ability and his diligence and his faithfulness. These funds, they've not been squandered. No way, not with a return like that. Nothing's been siphoned off. The nobleman, he's been well served. And so his servant is now up for a big promotion. Not that the nobleman... Now that the nobleman has been made king, he actually has the ability to give some really big gifts, to hand out some major responsibilities. The servant is now given not ten minas, no, ten cities over which he will have responsibility. Now, we we must assume that the nobleman actually always had this in mind. The the money must have been a kind of test. You know, he he knew that he was going to receive all these cities, and he, he knew that he needed rulers over the cities when he would be crowned king. So which of the servants within the household, people I know, which of them are up to the task? Well, the, the stewardship of that little mina would actually give him a lot of insight. See, this is shrewd management. And, and the servant, well, he proved himself amply. The next servant up for his report, he's, he's done very well too. Maybe not quite as well, but he's done well. Very well, in fact, verse 18. And the second came saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. Again, you can check my math, but I think that's 500%. I think that's a great return. Any wealth manager would, uh, you know, give his right arm for a return like that for a client. Truly outstanding performance. And the king, he's impressed, verse 19. And he said to him, and you are to be over five cities. You've done well, too. You've been productive. You've proved yourself trustworthy and capable. Now it's not just five minors for you. No, no, no. It's going to be five cities. You'll be in charge. You're, you're going to be responsible. See, the king, he's, he's pleased to see activity, productivity, uh, fruitfulness. He, he's glad to see a return on his investment. He's delighted to see that these servants have been industrious during the time of his absence. Now, we know that this nobleman represents the Lord Jesus Christ, our coming king. We know that his servants are his people, his disciples, his church. We know that this parable, it speaks to us. What do we learn here from the industrious servants and from the king's response to them at the time of his return? Well, clearly these are are the people. This is the group with whom the king is really pleased. These are the servants to emulate, whose model we are to follow. And, and in a sense, the lesson they give to us is actually quite a, quite a simple lesson. The king, he wants to see that we have waited well during the time of his lengthy absence. He wants to see that ours has been an active, industrious waiting. Nothing passive about our time of waiting. Like the nobleman in the story, the Lord Jesus, he's left each of us with a trust, with a stewardship, I, th- I think the stewardship functions on a number of different levels. It, it speaks of the money entrusted to us. It speaks of the gifts and the abilities he's given to us, the opportunities he has set before us to serve, the health, the vitality, the energy, the relationships around it, all of it, all of it. He's, he's been gracious to us on so many different fronts. He has entrusted much to each and every one of us. And the question is simply this, what are we doing with the king's resources. What are you doing with them, and what am I doing with them? It's so striking, isn't it, to see that the king is genuinely eager to see his assets put to use. I mean, he's got so much, but he wants to see that it, it, there's progress and there's productivity. He wants to see a return on each investment. 
And, and when he comes back, he wants to see tangible results. He wants to see that we've been engaging in business, as it were, engaging in productive and fruitful kingdom activity. You know, it is a reminder for us that Jesus hasn't just left us here in the waiting room, in the departure lounge, waiting for a delayed flight to get in so that our plane will be ready to take us home. You know, we're not, we're not just here to count the hours and the days to watch the clock. We're not clock watchers as the people of God. No, Jesus has left us here with gifts to steward. He's left us here with time, with talents, with treasure. And, and he expects us, each one, to be putting those things to fruitful use. He wants us to be energetic, to be creative, and he wants us to be entrepreneurial as we go about his business in his world. Now, in the big picture, you and I, we know the nature of the task that is before us. It is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ by fulfilling the Great Commission by going out and making disciples of all nations. That, that's our job description in the big picture. Those are our marching orders as the people of God. And so we ask, well, how can we best use the gifts that he has left in our care to achieve his mission in the world, to move forward his kingdom work? We need to ask that question because we know from the parable and we know from elsewhere in Scripture that the king will actually call us to account for our use of those things. We are answerable to him for our stewardship. And it's remarkable to think that the king actually has rewards in store for those who are faithful in this way. He gives out further responsibility within the kingdom when he comes back. We don't know exactly what that will look like, of course, what it would mean for us in a precise way. But the prospect is, is, is wonderful, remarkable. You know, our faithfulness now, our fruitfulness now, it will have a bearing upon our responsibilities and our privileges in the age to come. I think that's worth reflecting upon. I think that's worth uh, being mindful of. And so with all that in mind, let, let me invite you just to take a little audit, even, even now, just a little audit of your life for a moment and, and ask the question, ask it of yourself. What has the Lord entrusted to me? What has the Lord entrusted to me for this time while he is away and I am here about his business? What are the resources he has given me to use for his kingdom and his work? I wonder how you begin to answer that question as you ponder it even now. You know, maybe the Lord has given you special gifts, special abilities. Maybe you are particularly gifted in administration or in hospitality or, or in, in coming alongside others and being a, a practical help to them in times of need. Maybe you've been gifted as a Bible teacher, as an encourager. Maybe you have a gift in music or in other kinds of useful areas that are helpful for kingdom work. Well, the Lord has gifted you. He's left that gift with you as a stewardship and a, as a trust. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? How are you putting it to use. Maybe the Lord has gifted you in this season of life with the gift of time. You have time. Maybe you've retired, tired a little early, and you've still got health. You've got energy. Or, 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 or you're at home, but, you know, the kids have gone off to college or have moved away, and you, you've suddenly got some new spare capacity that you didn't used to have. Or you're a student, and you have a long summer break before you. Okay, well, the time that you have is a gift from the Lord. It is a stewardship. How are you going to use it? How are you going to invest it? And then, of course, our material assets, our finances, our resources. That's the category, isn't it, that's most natural to the parable. I mean, the ten mine is the money left by the nobleman. This is the most obvious thing to think about. Well, maybe the Lord has entrusted you with a, a special stewardship of this kind, to some extent, he's entrusted all of us with a stewardship of this. We all have possessions we hold in trust. Maybe it's money. You've been blessed in that way. Perhaps, perhaps you've got a good home that can be used for hospitality and to help others. Or perhaps you have a second home that could be useful for the kingdom and for the people of God. Maybe you have other resources of other kinds, equipment, tools, vehicles, and goods. None of these things, I mean, remember, none of them belongs to us personally, of course, not in the final sense. The Lord has left them in our hands for a short time. They are a stewardship from him 
They are a trust. What are you doing with them? How are you investing those things, and how am I for the master's work, for the king's agenda, for his great domain? It's helpful, isn't it? It's helpful for us to be reminded that we will have to give an account at the final day for our stewardship when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. On that day, when we stand before him, will he be pleased with our industry? Will he commend our faithfulness? See, the Lord, he gives us opportunity to make the most of what he's entrusted to us. And it's clear, it's clear from the parable, he really wants us to go for it. I mean, he wants us to be industrious with the help and the leading of his Holy Spirit. The, the language is entrepreneurial, isn't it? Unavoidably so. Engage in business. I mean, start something, do something, be enterprising. You know, we don't know how, mu- how many years the Lord will give each of us here, but, but we know we, we've got the time that's before us. We've, we've got the gifts that he's given. And here's the thing, we need to take hold of the opportunity to serve him and to honor him, and to make disciples, and to get the good news out while we can. That's why we're here. And, you know, I, I, it's so easy, isn't it? I think it's so easy for us to lose focus a little bit, to lack drive and energy, to shy away from, from risk. But that's what I love about this parable. Jesus is telling us, you know, get out there and get on with it. And church history is just full of wonderful stories of believers who did that, that very thing. I mentioned some weeks ago the story of C.T. Studd, who in the 19th century gave up a life of privilege and wealth in England and a, actually a bright future career as a cricketer in order to serve as a missionary in China and later in Africa. He had lots of quotable quotes, Studd, but uh, he once declared that Christ, and I quote, wants not nibblers of the possible, but grabbers of the impossible, by faith in the omnipotence, fidelity, and wisdom of the Almighty Savior. In other words, the Lord wants people who will be ambitious for the kingdom, who will strive for a great return on the Lord's gifts. And, and Studd's life, it, ex- it exemplified that. But, you know, we might th- think back another couple hundred years to the father of modern missions, to William Carey, who through his writing inspired the founding of the early mission agencies in the UK and the USA, and who went as a a missionary to India at the end of the 18th century. He was a gifted linguist and intellectual, and he gave himself to the translation of the Bible, actually, to a number of important languages and dialects for India. And, And so in the end, he gave the gift of the Bible to that great land, and he had a profound and lasting impact there for the gospel. Carey is credited with saying that we ought to attempt great things for God and expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God, expect great things from God. Well, Carey, he attempted great things. He, he used the gifts entrusted to him, and God did accomplish very wonderful things. There was a huge return. And actually, through his legacy, there continues to be a huge return from that investment of his gifts even today. Well, friends, are we those, are you one who is attempting great things for God with what he's entrusted to you and expecting that God might do wonderful things with your life and with your gifts offered back up to him for his service? The first profile Jesus gives us is of a life marked by industry the fruitful and the faithful servant. The next profile he gives us is of a life marked by inactivity. Inactivity, at least when it comes to the matter of stewardship. Returning king, he's calling his servants before him, and the first two reports, they've been fantastic. They've been just wonderful. But now comes the next one. Very different picture. Verse 20. Then another came saying, Lord, here is, here's your, here's your minor which I kept um, laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit, and you reap what you did not sow. It's a very, very sorry scene. It's a pathetic portrait. The servant, he's got nothing. 
nothing to show for himself except for the very minor that was left in his care. It's been wrapped up in a handkerchief of all things, stuffed under the bed, and now it reemerges after all this time and, you know, simply just handed, handed back. The, the servant has been nothing more than a rather ineffective safe deposit box. He's achieved nothing beyond the simple fact that he didn't lose the minor. Now, to try and help himself through this rather awkward moment, he, he kind of grasps for an excuse, and he does his best in the end to blame the king himself for this failure in stewardship. He, he said he was afraid of the king, you know, because he's a harsh and an unreasonable man, and he didn't want to get in trouble for losing the minor, so he just hid it away and did nothing with it. It seemed like the only thing to do. It's a very lame excuse. Even if it were true, it's pathetic, but we don't glean anywhere else in the account that the king is actually harsh like this. And actually, to his servants who are faithful, he shows immense generosity, doesn't he, and honor. So the whole thing, it's, it's profoundly unconvincing. And the king himself, well, he's, um, he's unimpressed. He doesn't bother to fight the unproductive servant on the matter of the character assassination. He just lets that slide. But he has very hard words for him, verse 22. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. Now, that's a pretty scary way to start before the king. When the king says, I will condemn you, that's a fearful thing to hear. And then to be called a wicked servant, in utter contrast to the faithful servant who just came by, that's unsettling. You knew that I was a severe man, did you, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow? Why then did you not put my money in the bank, and at my coming I might have at least collected it with interest? Why didn't you do something even modest? something risk-free, but something with what I entrusted, it, uh, with what I entrusted to you. you. You could have invested some small amount of money in world missions, couldn't you? You could have given a few hours to serve the people of God. You could have made some effort, couldn't you, have to share the gospel, but nothing? I mean, nothing? You did nothing? And he said to those who, who, who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. And they said to him, Lord, he's got 10 minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. The servant is left with nothing. It's, it's not simply that he doesn't get a city to rule. No, not even that. He loses his mina. He has nothing for the future, no responsibility, no opportunity nothing. Now, we might have thought that the king would view the inactive and unproductive servant as disappointing. But notice the strength of his reply. It's far more than that. This servant is wicked and is condemned by his words, and he even loses what he has. It is a strong response. It's stronger than we might have anticipated, I think. But Here's the thing, the king is profoundly displeased by inactivity among his servants. He hates to see a gift wasted. Well, what are we to make of this sad scene, this rather pathetic profile? Well, here is someone who identifies as a servant of the king. He's given a stewardship, and he refuses to do anything useful with it. He, he tucks it away under the mattress, and he gets on with the, his own concerns. It's worth saying he may well have been busy uh, in life in other ways. He may well have been busy with his family concerns, with his social life, with his other hobbies and interests. He, he may lead a very busy and active life on one level when it comes to his personal pursuits, but when it comes to the Lord's business, here's the thing, he is completely inactive. I mean, there's no sign of involvement in the Lord's work. There's no sign of employing his God-given gifts. There's no sign of investing the Lord's funds in the work of the kingdom. Oh, yes, he's in church on, on Sunday or at least a couple of Sundays a month, you know. And if he misses one, he might even watch online at some point during the week. He's, he's not completely disappeared. He hasn't stopped calling himself. She hasn't stopped calling herself a servant of the king. But there's no sign of industry, of service, of investment, of fruitfulness. I wonder if you know anyone like that. I wonder if the profile perhaps sounds just a little too familiar. 
I guess it describes more church-going people than we might like to admit. I guess the description matches more lives than we might care to acknowledge. But Jesus, he, he paints the picture and he tells the story for a reason. He tells it because it's a wake-up call and, and it's a warning and it is a spur to action. Now, I, I should say that there is some debate among the commentators as to whether this servant actually represents a genuine Christian believer. I wonder if you thought about that as, as, as we've been looking at it. It's an interesting question. I mean, on the one hand, he is called a, a servant, and that's different from the rebellious citizens we meet in this story, and we're going to come to them in a moment. This servant, he, he, he loses his responsibilities in the end, but he isn't slaughtered along with the king's enemies. That's significant. But at the same time, the, the, the king, he does call this servant wicked. And in the way that the servant speaks of the king, he barely seems to know him for who he is. In the end, maybe this is a picture of a believer who is just saved, but saved as through fire, to use Paul's language uh, that he employs elsewhere. Maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe we don't need to pin it down too closely from the parable. But, but, but I think we can all see that Jesus wants us to take this servant as a warning. And he wants us to ask the very hard question. He wants us to ask, is there any danger that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes again, will look at my use of his gifts and say, there's been no productivity, no fruitfulness, no return? Is there any danger of that? If there is any danger of that, what needs to change in my life, even now? What needs to change with some intention and with real urgency? For some, waiting is marked by industry, by faithful investment. For others, it is marked by inactivity. But worse than that, for some, the time of waiting is marked by sheer insurrection. As soon as the nobleman leaves home, his enemies start to rise up and express their disdain for him. And they make plans to undermine his rule before ever he returns. They don't want him as king. In fact, they, they don't want him back at all. But his citizens hated him, we read, and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. While the nobleman is away receiving his kingdom, the citizens of the territory club together to overturn his rule. Before it ever begins, they despise him. They do not want to be subject to him, and they don't mind saying so very openly. I wonder if it's ever struck you how very strange it is that so many citizens of this world hate and despise the Lord Jesus Christ. Wherever you go, all around the world, his name is misused, his word is disdained, his reputation is derided, his rule is actively rejected. It's a full-on global insurrection against the coming king. We see it all around us every day, don't we? It is the way in which so many in this world around us are passing the time between Jesus' ascension on high and his return in glory. Now, Jesus knew all about that. He predicted it. None of it is a surprise to him. But we need to take note of the fact that he not only predicted the insurrection, but he articulated what would be his response upon his return. Notice it with me, verse 27. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. While the nobleman is away being crowned, his enemies feel that they can just get away with this outright rebellion. They feel emboldened. They feel there will be no consequences to this rebellion at all. They can do what they like. They can treat the king as they please. And that's true today, of course, isn't it? We see it all around us. And, and I, I, I have no idea, but it may be true even in your life. You're here. You're listening. You're doing so out of politeness to a friend or out of some degree of curiosity. But in truth, you do not want the Lord Jesus Christ reigning over you. Oh, no. You are opposed to him in your heart of hearts. Well, if that's the case with you, and I have no idea, please know this. The Lord Jesus Christ will not allow the insurrection to go on indefinitely. It will come to an end. And he will judge the rebel and the lawbreaker. There will be a dreadful day 
on which the sword of judgment will fall. It's often been observed that in the skyline of the great city of London, at the, uh, across two parts of the skyline, not far from one another, there are two very significant symbols related one to another. Over the uh, Old Bailey, the central criminal court, there is a gold statue of Lady Justice. She holds uh, scales in one hand and the sword of justice in the other. That's one important symbol. But not far from the Old Bailey, atop St. Paul's Cathedral, there stands another symbol, yes, of justice, uh, but also of mercy, the cross of Christ. And for those who face the sword of justice that is perched above the courts of justice, for those who are currently caught up in the insurrection and who have cause to fear the return of the king, for you, if that's your situation today, here is the hope you may have. The king who is to return first hung upon the cross for you and for me. And he paid there the price of our rebellion, our sin. He died that we might be forgiven. He was quite literally, to use the language of our passage, slaughtered. He was slaughtered, dying the rebel's death, so that you and I might be spared. If you're caught up in the insurrection today, let me urge you, would you look by faith to the cross of Christ, to that other symbol of justice and of mercy? Would you receive his forgiveness? And would you bow the knee to the king who will soon come again? Three postures for waiting, three ways to wait, three profiles. A waiting marked by industry, a waiting marked by inactivity, and a waiting marked by insurrection. Where are you in these three? Where do you see yourself today? And what is the personal response of heart that you need to make even today as we await the return of the King? Let's pray together as we close. God, our Father, we thank you for the King who came and lived among us and died the rebel's death. We thank you for his ascension on high and the promise of his return. We pray that you would help us by your spirit to be a people who wait well, whose lives are marked by, marked by fruitful use of the gifts you have entrusted to us. And we pray that we would each one be ready for his return. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. This message was brought to you from Encounter the Truth. To learn more about Encounter the Truth, visit us online at EncounterTheTruth.org.